Manfred von Richthofen. Does that name sound familiar to anybody? I'll bet you it does, though. He was a famous German World War I fighter pilot who's better known as the Red Baron. <laughs> he flew a distinctive tri, uh, tri wing Red Fokker plane. He, it is said that he shot down 80 aircraft, more combat planes than anyone else on either side of World War I. On April 21st, 1918, though, the Red Baron began chasing after a Canadian sop with camel, uh, camel plane that was trying to escape uh, the battle and flying over the Somme River back into Allied territory. And as the Red Baron pursued his prey, he strayed behind those Allied lines, which to him was an enemy, and he flew at too low of an altitude, which opened him up to being shot by soldiers on the ground. A single bullet shot from an anti-aircraft machine gun hit Richthofen in the chest, which resulted ultimately in his death. It is believed that the Red Baron was overly focused, overly focused, on pursuing a plane that had been attacking his cousin's aircraft in combat. And so he pursued after that Allied plane, and it, which is an error, and ended up costing him his life. Because instead of staying where he should have, he flew to the rescue, which caused the Allied Canadian airplane then to pull away and fly at a low altitude uh, across the, uh, to the Allied side. The Red Baron had often in training other pilots, advised them to never do that. And yet, he went against his own advice, and he pursued that plane anyway. And that's when he was shot from the ground, and the Red Baron came to his end because he made the mistake of pursuing this Allied plane too long, too far, and too low into enemy territory, as one newspaper reporter summed it up. You know, as I think about that, too long, too far, too low into enemy territory. I think sometimes that's exactly what we do as well. And it's always something that eventually, you know, will bring you down. And, and there is always something that, that, that is constantly eating away at us, isn't there? Like when you're going along just smoothly and you're, you're flying and everything seems to be fine, but then one day you realize... You've been making some poor decisions for yourself for a long time now, and those consequences of those choices are suddenly catching up with you. You were flirting with disaster all along, but you never even realized it until it was too late. Bad choices will lead to hurt. Bad choices will lead to heartache. And when it comes to God and our relationship with him, sometimes we forget about his spiritual truths and his principles for our life that would help us to live better. And I'm not sure why we forget such important matters, but I know it to be true. In the Old Testament, for instance, God had Israel often build monuments and write down accounts and tell stories over and over again about all the events that took place regarding their relationship with him. And, and they would forget so easily, though. And truth be told, we forget easily, too, don't we? We flirt with disaster because we forget our past. We forget who we are as people of God. It doesn't usually start out as a big deal. It doesn't even start out as a conscious choice. But when we lose our way and we get into trouble, it's usually more subtle than that, kind of like how the Red Baron met his end when he subtly chased after this other airplane. But really, that's how Satan works best, isn't it? To bring us down. He puts these little ideas into our head, these little ideas and, and suggestions and, that might not add up to a whole lot at first, but after a while, they start to pile up on one another. And those little choices that at first didn't make any big difference, you know, we kind of owned our choices. We were still in control. All of a sudden, those choices will come to own us, and we can't control them so easily anymore. And all of us must be on guard against the devil's insidious schemes. And that's what I want to talk with you about today. So open up your Bible or your smartphone to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. Those are the main verses where we're going to be today. 
1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. And what I want us to do here is I want us to see what kind of insight we can gain from this text so that when we're flirting with disaster, maybe you feel like you're already living a disaster. I don't know. But maybe we can somehow find our way back to a life that is blessed by God by paying attention to these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. There are all kinds of things that can crop up into our life and prevent us from finishing well. And so what can we do about it? Well, in, in this text that we're looking at today, the Apostle Paul gives us four insights that will help us to avoid ending up in disaster. Instead, what we can do is end up with a life that's blessed by God, and that's what we all want, right? We want to live a life that's blessed by God. So how do we do that? Well, <clears throat> the first insight that will help you to avoid disaster and gain blessing is to remember who you are and don't take God for granted. You've got to remember who you are. Don't take God for granted. You know, this comes out in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 5, and I'm, I have to say I'm kind of concerned sometimes about the absence of the fear of God amongst those who say they follow Jesus. And I'm not saying that we should live constantly afraid of God. I'm not saying that, but you know what? When a person doesn't have any fear of the Lord whatsoever in the sense of respecting what God desires and wants, what I've noticed is it'll make us vulnerable to the subtle sins that creep up unnoticed in our lives. And that's when we become too comfortable with God. That's when we become too familiar with God in a way that causes us to just forget him and the fact that he is the final judge of all life, isn't he? God is the final judge of all life. And we might want to be a little bit more careful about how we live and what our priorities are and what we devote ourselves to in light of the fact that God is the final what? The final judge. He is the final judge of all of life. Furthermore, there are good and bad consequences to our actions that we are accountable for. And so we need to be proactive, right, in how we live if we hope to walk in purity rather than just to live carelessly. It's very similar to what happened in ancient Israel when God so graciously and powerfully provided for the people. But then they would just kind of ignore him as if he never existed. Well, 1 Corinthians 10 verses 1 through 5 says this, for I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness." So what we see here is Paul using this illustration from the Old Testament to show the Christians of Corinth what can happen if we get too comfortable in our faith, if we get too lazy in our walk with God. The Israelites had it made as they lived under God's generous provision, didn't they? I mean, these guys had it made. They saw God lead them through the Red Sea. They saw God feed them miraculously out in the desert. They saw God remove them from the harshness of all this slavery. They had everything they needed to survive and flourish out in the wilderness when they were traveling to the land that God had promised them. And you would think that they would cherish their relationship with God by being his faithful followers. Surely they would carry out their responsibility to, to live as light, reflecting him to the rest of the world, reflecting God's holiness in the way that they lived. But they didn't. It was as if they totally forgot about God. And so they lived these carnal lives. They lived these discontented lives, always wanting more. They lived constantly out of touch with God. And rather than live with gratitude for his blessings, remembering how good God was to them, they took him for granted. And at that moment, they lost their spiritual influence in the world. Because nobody could take them seriously. And God could not work through them. Well, a second insight that will help you and me to avoid disaster and live a life that's blessed by God is this. 
We need to stop pursuing sin and intentionally live like you believe in God. Stop pursuing sin, intentionally live like you believe in God. And here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 6 through 10. Now, these things occurred as examples to them to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it's written. The people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We shouldn't commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and, and in one day 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. Paul says these things occurred as examples for us so that we wouldn't crave evil things as they did. You know, when we drift away from God, it starts with a, a, a craving for things that are evil, doesn't it? Do you see that? Paul brings that out in this, these verses. The battle for our allegiance, it, it begins in our mind and our, in our heart. And that's when we become consumed by our own sinful desires until, you know, we find ourselves out of control or maybe we're addicted or we're trapped by our own appetite for more. It begins with a secret craving of evil things. It may be with another person. It could be with internet porn or prescription drugs or food or whatever. And when Paul says not to be idolaters, what that means is we are not to put anything else in front of God, right? These other things that, that cause us to stumble and fall or sin against God, these are the sort of things that sometimes we pursue more than him. And Paul says, don't do that. <laughs> because that's exactly what the Israelites did, and it got them in trouble. Well, idolatry occurs when we put something else in place of Christ. You and I do that. From time to time, it usually happens in secret, silent little ways, doesn't it? Eventually getting to the point where Jesus no longer sits as the Lord of our hearts. You know, he, he no longer sits on the, the throne as our king. Idolatry happens when we're habitually preoccupied with something or someone that we shouldn't be. And Jesus gets pushed to the side of our life. It's kind of like, you know how a beach erosion happens. I grew up with a, with a gravel pit, and I saw this happen there when, when, one time uh, when we had heavy spring rains. But we, we'll see this on the ocean, too, when storms come. Or out in California, this beach erosion, it usually doesn't happen just right on an onslaught. It's usually a little bit at a time. Until all of a sudden you look out at the beach, and it's not there anymore, right? And you never notice it until that point. And, and you go out, and the destruction is obvious, and uh, it has been occurring for a long time. Sometimes that's how idolatry works in our life. Sometimes that's how sin works in our life. And you know where all of this idolatry ends up? We're constantly <clears throat> replacing God in our life with other things, and where that all ends up? It ends up in our grumbling against God. We grumble against God, and we shake our fist at Him, and I've seen people do that. And they're mad at God for things happening in their life that are happening because they brought them on themselves. And it's such a pitiful scene when that happens, when God's people who have been loved by him and who have you know, been tenderly cared for by him end up complaining and grumbling against him. And Paul says in so many words that we need to stop pursuing sin and we need to intentionally pursue God living as if we really do believe he exists. Because so often we live like he really doesn't exist, right? Let's, start, let's turn that around. Let's start living like we really do believe he exists. Here's a third insight from Paul that will help us to avoid disaster and finish strong. Don't say, this will never happen to me. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 11 and 12. You know, every moral fall has a history. It begins with a series of small, unnoted leaks 
in the tire of our character. You know, if our character was like a tire, right? We, we get those, those leaks from time to time. And like a tire on a car, you don't usually notice it's leaking air until you see the tires flat in the driveway, right? Or you go out into the parking lot and it's flat. Or you're driving down the road and you hear this thud, 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 thud as, it's, as the wheel's hitting the, the tire and the, and the wheel. And just like a flat tire, failure of character can happen to me. And it can happen to you if we're not careful. It can happen to anyone. And so in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, and 12, we read, These things happen to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Hmm. That's a powerful warning right there. <clears throat> I came across this old story about an eagle who, on an early morning during the spring thaw, soared high above the forest. It was looking for something to eat. And as he followed the course of a river, he looked down and he spied a small rodent trapped on a piece of ice that had broken free and was now floating down the stream. And so seeing an easy meal, this eagle swooped down and landed on the ice, killed the mouse, and began to eat. Well, as he continued his meal, he saw that his perch was rapidly approaching a waterfall, but he determined to finish eating and thinking he would just rise into the air, right, and fly safely away at the last moment, the eagle continued its breakfast course. And as the ice neared the falls, the eagle finished its last bite. Satisfied with his breakfast, he spread his mighty wings and attempted to rise skyward as that chunk of ice began tipping over the edge of the waterfall. But while he was enjoying his meal, as the story goes, he failed to notice that the warmth of his feet had caused his talons to become embedded in the ice. And try as he might, he could not free himself from what now had become this heavy burden that would carry him down to his death to those rocks far below. Now that story has a moral to it. What is the moral of the story? Don't fool yourself. Don't be overconfident thinking, you know, it can never happen to you. That is a recipe for disaster. Because given the right circumstances, any of us is capable of mess messing up. Well, Paul's final insight for avoiding disaster and ending with a life that is blessed is this. Recognize that God wants you to finish well, and he will help you. And that comes out in verse 13. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. God is extremely gracious to us as he helps us to move beyond our temptations. There have been times in my life when God has helped me to avoid sin by maybe bringing somebody to the door unexpectedly, or maybe somebody calls on the phone out of the blue, and it's enough to get my mind onto the right path again, onto healthier thoughts, right? Right? God has helped me to get through temptation by convicting my heart of what's right and wrong so that I will choose to do what's right by staying on a godly path. He has also caused scriptures that I've read or memorized come to mind so that I can stay tuned in with God rather than with my own desires. And sometimes I get through temptations just by the grit of self-discipline. You know, God pulls my heart's desire back to him so that I'm no longer distracted by temptation's pull. But another thing that helps me to get through temptation is to remember who I am and to remember what I'm to be like. And maybe this idea would help you as well. I'm to be like God in my character. I'm to represent him well. Two thoughts from Scripture help me to identify myself with Christ rather than with my own temptation, when temptation comes knocking on my door. First, Jesus says we're to be like salt and light. Do you remember when Jesus taught us that in the Sermon on the Mount? In Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, he says, You are salt 
the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. We are to be the kind of people who create thirst in others for God. And we're to be the kind of people who add good taste to what otherwise would be bland and useless. Furthermore, Jesus says we are to bring God's light, right? God's light of order into this dark world of chaos. So besides being salt and light, as Jesus points out, though, the Apostle Paul points out another example with which we can identify. Paul says we are to be like a self-disciplined athlete. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Paul says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and I make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. You know, successful athletes, they're not just born. They have to deliberately train themselves. They have to deliberately cultivate their muscles and train and how to think strong. Paul wants us to realize that identifying yourself with Jesus goes beyond merely saying you do. No one will ever get anywhere without being self-disciplined by constantly preparing themselves to be God's person. Just as an athlete must train with intensity if he or she is going to win their race, so must the follower of Jesus understand that sacrifice and self-discipline is required so that we can live our life well, free from the behaviors and the attitudes that would disqualify us in the end. When I identify myself with Jesus, I see myself as salt and light and as a self-disciplined athlete who lives for God. Why? Because our eternity hangs in the balance and other people's eternity hinges on that and hangs in the balance as well. I do not want to hurt my Christian witness. I do not want to hurt my own faith by not finishing well. How many of you have ever seen the movie The Lion King? In the movie The Lion King, came out in 1994. It's hard to believe how old that movie is already. But it has great animation. It has a great storyline. The, the music is fun, and, and Disney promoted it well. Well, the story focuses on this young lion prince, right? He's born in Africa, and his birth made his uncle Scar, who had first been first in line to inherit the throne. Now he's second in line to inherit the throne, right? And so Scar, he plots with all the hyenas to kill King Mufasa and Prince Simba so that he can make himself the king. The king is killed, and Simba is led by his uncle Scar to believe that it was his fault, and so Simba flees the kingdom in shame. Well, after years of being in exile, he's persuaded to return home finally, to overthrow Scar and to claim the kingdom as his own, which is his rightful place, because he is the king, right? One of the most interesting parts of the movie to me is the part where Simba forgets who he is. And rather than live the life of a king, which is who he is, he settles for something less. You remember this? He's lazy, he's unambitious, and in the meantime, his homeland has fallen apart. The song Hakuna Matata becomes his mantra and the philosophy that he lives by. You remember these words? Hakuna Matata, what a wonderful phrase. Hakuna Matata, ain't no passing craze. It means no worries for the rest of your days. It's our problem-free, 
philosophy, say it with me, hakuna matata, right? <laughs> and, and Simba, he becomes convinced that this is the new way that he's going to live and that his past is the past and he's just going to forget about it. It doesn't matter who he is. And Simba forgets who he is. He lives a purposeless and less than impressive lifestyle even though he is the king of the savannah. And it's only when he remembers who he is that he moves again in a direction that gets his life back on track. I wonder if the story of the Lion King describes you this morning. I wonder if the story of the Israelites describes you today. Are you struggling with seeing the lessons of the past? You know, the Bible teaches us that history and the past can teach us something. No, we, we don't always want to live in the past and, past and be depressed by that. We have to get past our past, right? It's never good for us to never get past the past. But it can teach us so that we don't repeat the same mistakes again and so that we don't make mistakes that others have done. And it can help us to live a life that is energized and to live a life that is blessed by God when we see with eyes of discernment. Do you see yourself for who you are as God's person? Understand that he gives mercy and compassion to all who will return to him by repenting of their sin and walking back in his direction. Turn from your sin. Confess to him your failure. Stop rationalizing what you're doing and ask the Lord to give you strength to overcome the choices and the actions that are leading you towards disaster. Get back in the race and run like you've never run before, only this time run with Jesus and keep running with him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you so much for your grace and your compassion in our life. And Lord, when we have failed to live our lives in a way that brings glory and honor to you, we just ask, God, that you would help us to get our feet back on the right path. If there are folks here or who are watching online that are just feeling beaten up right now and feeling like they've disqualified themselves and they're no longer in the race, I pray that your presence will bring strength and encouragement to them. That they will look to Jesus, who died on the cross for the forgiveness of their sins. And God, we will give you the glory and the honor through it all. May we find your favor and your blessing going with us this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.